Brother Jones, I appreciate you. Well, good morning, Mission for Life. It's good to see everyone, as always. If you would go ahead and stand with me, we'll go ahead and pray and dive into the bread of life this morning. Father, we thank you this morning for who you are. Lord God, you have poured your love out on us in a way that's unfathomable for our minds to really contain. But Lord, help us today. Father, I pray that you use this word this morning specifically today to help us realize the great love and the sacrifice through your son you made for us. We give you glory and honor. It all belongs to you. We thank you, Lord, for the worship we just experienced. All oh, made my heart glad to know those words ring true. Lord, I pray that today somebody might get saved and come to the realization that I need to come to the end of myself and allow the Lord to have fully, uh, full reign in my life. Father, I pray I decrease now. Father, I pray you give me the ability to teach your word as you would have me to teach it, not of my own will, but of your will only. In Jesus' name I pray. The church said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. So this morning, I want to talk about it. This is the subject I don't talk about it much. Um, and I talked to y'all last week about how when when I get get done on Sundays, I'm always asking, Lord, okay, what's next, Lord? What's next? You know, I don't do a bunch of series. Sometimes I do, but it was immediately after uh, I preached last week. He said, you need to preach this particular topic. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about hell is a real place. Okay, hell is a real place. So you won't see me joking around. You know, I'm going to joke that hard. You know, I feel good. And little corny jokes in there at the time. And y'all, y'all fancy me by laughing at them from time to time. But today, this is a very serious topic, and it's serious in, in terms of anytime you start talking about hell, there's nothing to laugh about. Amen. 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 And so I'm going to read two passages of scripture this morning. Uh, I'm kind of going to do this backwards. I'm going to go to Revelations chapter 21. We're going to look at verses uh, 6 through 8. Revelation 21, verses 6 through 8. And then we're going to back up and go to 2 Thessalonians. And look at chapter 1 and read verses 7 through 9. Eugene stopped a little early because he must have knew I was going to need about an hour and a half for this message today. So Revelation chapter 21 verses 6 through 8. The Bible reads, And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Y'all notice there, he says, it is finished. Remember the other time he said it is finished? On the cross. On the cross. Now this is a different dispensation. He's saying it, saying it now as the new Jerusalem has come down. And those of us who belong to him are born into the new Jerusalem. He says, and it is finished. And I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Verse 8, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, and let me, let me say the sexually immoral. I'm going to pause here for a second, and I have to say this. I just talk to too many people who think casual sex is okay. It's not a big deal. And we're shacking together. It's not a big deal. We're going to get married and all that. But listen, sexual immorality is sexual immorality. Amen. God does not excuse it because you excuse it. So the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, let me help you with this one. You know what God compared witchcraft to? disobedience. Idol worshipers placing anything above him. And all liars. All liars. All liars. <laughs> Their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Amen. Now flip with me over to and it'll be on the wall behind me. Second Thessalonians verse 
uh, chapter 1, verses 7, 7 through 9. I hear people just still turn, so I'm going to let you get there. I love Hill's pages turn. That's why I will always wait on page turn. That means you have your real Bible with you. I love it. Are you there? Say amen. And the word of God reads, and God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people. Praise from all who believes. And this includes you, for you believe what we told you about him. And I know I went a, a step further with that verse. This morning, listen, my first point in hell is a real place. What I want to do is I want to dispel some myths about hell. Y'all know how the enemy works. The enemy has a, uh, a, a propensity uh, to put misinformation out about things concerning God's word. He does it all the time. I, I, I kind of shouted a couple things last week and we finished it in sync and they're not even scriptural. So this morning, I want to talk about, before we get into this, I want to talk about myths about hell. Myths about hell that are floating out there, and people in the church are actually, actually debating some of these. So the first one is, uh, hell doesn't exist. <laughs> Somebody said, that's a lie. He's absolutely right. You'd be surprised how many believers, though, will argue that point. They would argue that point. And, the, and let me tell you why. Because it's hard to accept that a place like, like that exists and God is the author of that. But for those who doubt it, God has given us substantial evidence that hell does exist in his infallible message to us. Listen to Luke chapter 12. I have a lot of scripture today. A lot of scripture. Luke chapter 12 verses 4 through 5. Listen to what it says. It says, if you don't believe hell exists, consider this, these Jesus words. He says, I tell you, my friends... Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you shall fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. It's Luke 12, 4 through 5. If you don't believe hell exists, ladies and gentlemen, then you don't believe scripture. In the story. Now I've got several more of these. Here's, here's the second myth that we have to dispel and stop having these conversations about purgatory. First of all, purgatory is a Roman Catholic doctrine. As believers, we don't agree with anything hardly that the Roman Catholic agrees to or adheres to. I talked about the Pope last week. I'm going to spare you this week talking about him, but this is absolutely heresy. Now, let me tell you what purgatory is. It is a place or state of suffering inhabited by the souls of sinners who are expiating their sins before going to heaven. Let me tell you what expiating means. It means that they're, they're, they're working off their sins so that they can graduate to heaven. Now, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Because we could do whatever the heck we want to do, just part it down. Do whatever it is you like doing, because I got purgatory to look forward to. So when I get to purgatory, I just work this off. It may be five years, but I'm going to be all right. <laughs> Guys, let me help you. That does not exist. Amen. Purgatory was a lie created by the Catholic Church to make people feel good. Or actually, maybe to make themselves, the leadership, feel good. Some of the stuff they was doing are still doing under the sheets, if you know what I mean. Wink, wink. 
And then secondly, they came up with a little uh, situation to go with purgatory where you could pay the priest to take some of the debt off your purgatory dwelling. Yeah. It was just another way to make money. Mm. They had a little jingle with it. I won't bore you with that. But purgatory is a myth. Mm -hmm. You will not find it in your scripture. The third one, Jesus didn't talk about hell. You people talk about Jesus never talked about hell. Jesus talked about hell almost more than any other topic. He did talk about hell. That's a common misconception that people say. Jesus talked about hell more than anyone else in the Bible talked about hell. In fact, Jesus talked about hell more often than he talked about heaven. Did y'all realize that? He talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. That's crazy. But he did. Here's why. Because he knew the severity of it. He wanted people to understand, yes, there's a heaven, but there's also a hell. You get to choose. There's also a notion that God only talked about hell in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. Being that the New Testament is all about good news. It's all about love. It's all about, you know, how wonderful God is. And he is awesome. Folks, it's time to open up your Bible and read them so you can see what he did talk about. Hell is very real, and it was important that Jesus speak to this often. Now, here's the next myth we need to dispel. Hell is temporary. Another lie. I got some strong beliefs in here. That's another lie. I like that because it's exactly what it is. Jesus, just as heaven is eternal, hell is eternal. Jesus talked about this again. As Christians, we believe that the righteous will inherit the kingdom that they have been citizens of doing life on earth, and the unrighteous will be told to depart from Jesus. This is what Jesus told the apostles when he said this. He said, this is Matthew 25, 46. He says, then the unrighteous will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That's Matthew 25, 46. So what will be the truth of your life? What will the verdict be? When the judgment comes for you, there will be two options, and they both are eternal. They both are eternal. There's nothing temporary here. Please understand. There's nowhere you can go work off your stuff. Here's the next myth. God sends people to hell. Well, God doesn't send people to hell. Hell is not a place that God sends you. This is what we send ourselves. We have free will to either choose life or to choose death. Amen. We have free will. So we send ourselves that if we choose to do that. There's another, this is another one of those common misconceptions that if he's such a good guy, why does he send people to hell? He doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves. And people say stuff like, oh, our God is just so loving. He'd never do anything like that. You're right. It allows you to make the decision. Another misconception. Hell won't be that bad. <laughs> he, I, it, it was hard for me to say that one. It was hard for me to Hell won't be that bad. What is that bad? You're burning with an unquenchable fire. You got the worms all over you. Your teeth are gnashing and grinding. Yeah, it's not that bad. But popular media, here's what happened. Popular media has depicted hell in movies, books, and music uh, in a place where you can go and you get with your friends and y'all just partying down. You partying with the demons. Y'all throwing it down. You're smoking it up. Whatever you're doing, whatever you want to do in hell. And it's just a nonstop, 24-7 party. Think again. Then you just got been watching too much TV. But that's the devil's deal. That's what he wants to do. Hell was designed as a place of horror and torment and torture. That is why it is repeatedly referred to as the lake of fire and brimstone. The Bible warns that we should not make light of this evil. The Bible tells us, listen to Proverbs 132, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. That's Proverbs 132. The only concern in hell is how bad the pain is. 
That's the concern we better have. How bad is the pain? Scripture is clear that hell is all about suffering eternally. It goes on and it goes on and on and it goes on and it goes on. And we'll see a passage later where he says forever and forever. Now when you got to put another forever with a forever, that's forever. <laughs> that's a long time. I mean, think about that. When the Lord puts another forever with a forever, <laughs> my goodness, that's a long time. Now, there is hope with God. Please hear me today. There's hope with God. For those of you who believe that, that you are destined for hell, and I want to stop right here and speak to you for a minute, uh, and you feel like you've done too much, you've gone too far, there is hope for you. God gives us what we, what we uh, don't deserve. And that is an opportunity for eternal hope. Amen. So this morning, as I was going through those myths, and, and you might have believed some of them, and you feel like, well, for me, I'm just doomed. Well, let me stop you. You're not doomed. You're only doomed if you choose to be doomed. Please hear me, especially young folks. You think you got all the time in the world. You don't know that. You may live to be 70 or 80 or 90. That's not a lot of time compared to forever. But there's no guarantee you'll live to be 25. I, I hate to say it, but as I, I go on in life, I see it. I see more parents bearing their children than any other time I can remember. So don't allow Satan to keep you away from God's love. He loves you beyond comparison. Now, beyond compare. Now, with that said, with that said, some of you don't have a point of reference for his love and what it's like. And here's the problem. We're watching people too much. That's a strong Christian. Look at them. They, look at how they treated me. And then we clump them in the same realm as God. And you've just blown it. Stop people watching in church and comparing their love to God's love. Stop parent watching. Some of us had some awful parents. Some of you are good parents. There have been some parents that didn't do a good job. And you just destroyed your child's ability to know what love is. I know I'm talking to some people. Now, that doesn't mean you hang out there and you don't forgive. But you can't compare your parents' love to God's love. It's nothing like it. Right. It's nothing like it. I had to get over that myself. I struggled my whole life with where was my dad? Was I not good enough that he would love me? Where was he? I had to do all these things by myself. I was a pretty good athlete. Every game I went to, I was there by myself as I saw the fathers watching their kids. Was I not enough to be loved, to, to have somebody there to support me? You see, these things play on your mind, and you grow up a bitter kid not knowing why you're bitter. And then you put God in the same category and you start saying, if God is real, he's going to have to prove it to me. That was my story. But boy, when he did, I, I experienced a love I had never thought possible. My point is, stop barking at the wrong tree. Talk to the Lord. He'll show you love immeasurable, unshakable, nothing like you've ever experienced in your whole life. Amen? Amen. Now, I need you to strap it on now because I'm getting ready to get in a fast mode and I'm going to go hard and heavy with a lot of scripture. Now, let me give you some truths about hell. So strap it on. Hell is a place of separation from God. Here's the verse. The verse is 2 uh, th uh, Thessalonians 1 and 9. I read it earlier. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Forever separated from the Lord. There's no Lord. Can you come get me now? I've had enough. None of that. Hell is a place of fire. Matthew 3 and 12 says it this way. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What is the chaff? The chaff are those. There's the wheat and the chaff. The chaff are those who's Come to church, play the game, and it's a lot of folks that do that. Play the game, and that's all they've done is play the game. They've done church. I call them church people. They're the chaff. He said he gathers them up, and he tosses them into the fire, and they burn up, and they continue to burn. And it's unquenchable. You can't do anything to stop it, Matthew 3 and 12. Listen to what Matthew 13, 41, 42 has to say. Now, guys, I'm giving you all scripture. These are not my opinions. Matthew 13, 41, 42 says, 
The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Still want to take that trip and have fun with your friends? Matthew 13, 50 says, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is in the same book. You see how Jesus keeps mentioning this? Revelation 20.15 says this. It says, And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The next truth. Hell is for the wicked. Hell is for the wicked. God never created hell for you and I. When he created Adam, the, in the original intent was for them to live how long? Forever. Forever. And ever. And ever. But they messed up, and so death was brought into the picture. Mm -hmm. Hell was made. Who, who, does anybody know who hell was originally made for? Lucifer. It was made for Lucifer, mm -hmm. who transitioned to Satan. Mm -hmm. That's who hell was made for him and all the angels who left with him. That's what the lake of fire was, was made for them. But he says, ye, you children of the devil who choose not to follow me, the devil is your father. So who we perpetrate or who we not perpetrate, but who we follow as we perpetrate, we're following Jesus. That's who our father is. That's what he said to the, to the Pharisees. These were the religious leaders of the day. And he said, you, your devil, the father, because they were perpetrating like they were by Jesus. Jesus said, no. No, if you knew my father, you would, you would know who I am. But your father is the devil who you follow based on how you treat me. Next point, hell is, hell is uh, the, the wise will avoid hell. The wise will avoid hell. Proverbs 15, 24 says this. It says, the way of life winds up for the wise that he may turn away from hell below. Proverbs 15, 24. Next point. We can endeavor to save others from hell. This is what Proverbs 23, 14 says. It says, physical discipline may save them from death. Y'all remember me reading this a few weeks ago? Maybe it was a week or two ago. Let me read this again. Proverbs 23, 14. Physical discipline may well save them from death. This death he's talking about is hell. Let me, this is for parents. Again, I'm going to address this one more time. When we do not apply the appropriate discipline for our children, they grow up to be little, they're little hellions when they're two and three when we don't discipline them. Let me just say what it is. And we think it's cute. You the only one in Walmart thinks it's cute. Half of Walmart wants to kill you and your kid because you won't do nothing to them. And then when they get big, then you wonder what happened. Let me roll the tape. It did happen in Walmart and at home when you wouldn't TTT, tear that tail up. <laughs> That's the discipline this verse is talking about. Guys, there, there comes a time. Now, I'm not talking about abusing your children. Please let me make this plain. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about getting yourself under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then when you don't want to spank them, that is the time you know it's right. You know, don't be like my mama. She'll hear this lady. She knows it's the truth. She come get you when she mad, and everybody better escape Alcatraz. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, because she coming for you. Shoe, belt, stick, whatever, man. <laughs> Why she is ticked off. And you either took it or never come back. So anyway, that verse is telling us specifically that we need to apply the discipline that's going to keep them from death. He's not talking about, he's talking about death, but he's also, also talking about spiritual death. Amen. Well, they don't respect authority. They don't respect freedom. Authority starts in the home. You, you think if they don't respect you, they're going to leave and, and just have this massive respect for folk? No. They don't respect mom and dad or whoever. If you're a single parent home, they don't respect you. They're not going to respect authority 
and it's going to lead to death. It's going to lead to death. Jude 23 says, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution. Hating the sins that contaminate their lives, we have a job to do. And that is God wants to use us in this thing called the Great Commission. See, when we don't have the perspective of how, of how bad hell is, we can walk right by people, know they're going to hell, and say, well, somebody else will handle it. Or we never even think about how bad it's going to be, and we don't open our mouths to people who are literally going to hell. Shame on us, church, but we have the greatest truth that there ever was, and we keep it to ourselves. That is not what God's called us to do. And Jude nails it. Show mercy to steal some and to, to others. In, in other words, every chance you get, you ought to be just probing and seeing where people are. And a lot of times, you don't really have to probe that much. You, you can tell. You know when people aren't right with the Lord. We know this. And it's our job to do what's ever necessary so that we can have a platform at some point to share the gospel. Paul said, I become as all men. Why? That I may have a chance to do what? Share the gospel. Now, he didn't say he did as all men did. He was able to make himself adapt to whatever the conditions were so that he could have a foot in to share the gospel. You see, that's why I love the Apostle Paul. All right, let me move on to the next, next fact. The beast, the false prophet, the devil, and the demons will be thrown into hell. Matthew 25, 41. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, prepare for the devils and his demons. Notice, it was prepared for the devils and his demons. Revelation 19, 20 says this. It says, And the beast was captured with him, the false prophet, who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. It's Revelation 19 and 20. Revelation 20 and 10 says this, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and forever. ever. No relief. No relief. Next fact. Hell has no power over the church of Jesus Christ. It has no power. Now, that's shout material. Listen to what Matthew 16 and 18 says. It says this. It says, Now I say to you, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Do y'all hear that? Amen. Now let me, let me just, let me, let me talk to y'all just for a minute. Some of you feel as though and this is what we've kind of been hanging out and ministering the last few months, some, the last several weeks anyway, that, that you've just been overwhelmed, overpowered. How can you make it through? I, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. These things are happening to me, and I feel like a complete, but where is God? God, where are you? Some of you have felt like that. Some of you feel like that today. <clears throat> you need to hang on to this truth. The powers of hell will not prevail against God's bride. Did y'all hear that? Amen. Now, let me tell you what the problem could be. Just, just maybe. Could it be the way you, because the reason you feel that way is number one, you don't really know the word. Number one. Number two, could it be because really you may know the word, but you're not walking with him. You know, we could know the word and not be walking with him. Uh, could it be you made a profession a long, long time ago and you made that profession, and that's all it was, it was a profession. In other words, you really don't know him at all. Could it be, I'm just throwing out scenarios. 
Because when people continually are in turmoil, continually, you know, feel like, where is God? You got to continue to ask that question. Then you don't know him. You don't know what to look for. You don't know, even in the midst of my hell, God is there. When you can't come to grips with that, I have real concern for you. And then maybe some of us have, have just abandoned our position. Well, what is my position in Christ? Here, here it is. Since I heard you ask me that, your position in Christ is, is, is several fold. Number one, he says, if you stay connected to me, then you can hear me and hear my direction. And you hear my voice. He says, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. That's number one. And then the other piece of that is we'll, we, we allow things that happen in the earth realm to pull us away. We allow little idols to pop up. And it could be in the form of our children. It could be in the form of a job. It can be in the form of a lot of different things. But when those things pull us away, the next thing we know, we look out, we're in the middle of the ocean, and Christ is over here waving. I'm over here. So there are some requirements for us as believers. The reason we can't hang on to this scripture that hell won't prevail against us is because we're experiencing hell. Some of it's self-inflicted. Come on now, we are. Some of us are experiencing self-inflicted hell. And then we want to ask God, where is he? And he's just looking at you going, I'm trying to help you. And you've inflicted these things upon yourself then some of the hell you experience is real. The enemy hates a believer who's really trying to walk with him. Remember I talked about, I warned you, those of you that said, when you stick your stake in the ground, and say, Lord, I'm really walking for you now. You better mean it. But you better understand something. There's a thing called warfare, and it's real. He don't have, I've said that he doesn't have to mess with you if you're already walking alongside him. He doesn't. I have to say this again. But I'm telling you, the warfare is real. That's why it says, don't leave the house undressed. Ephesians chapter 6, put your armor on and be ready for a battle. A battle is just that. It's a fight. It's war. But we've already prevailed. That's what we don't get. We're in the middle of it and some of us want to quit. You look, that truth, uh, uh, what is it, the, the, the belt of righteousness? Uh, the belt of truth, which one is it? I'm, I'm, the belt of truth falling all down your waist because you ain't read the script in three weeks. Crown of righteousness when you start sliding over doing what everybody else does. It's all he understands. Yes. The point is get dressed. Put your war clothes on and understand he can't. He will not prevail. He can't. But positionally we have to be in the right position. Or you will get whipped every which way but loose. Everybody understand? Amen. So today, get in right position. Some of us, the position is simply salvation. Let me tell you, just here, as I was going through all of these scriptures and reading, you know, what hell is and what it's like and how Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven, man, I began to really get heavy and sad in my spirit because if what, he, if what his word says is true, then even in this small church, there's a percentage of us on our way to hell and we don't even know it. You see, the, the worst deception is self-deception. When you think you're okay, and status quo sits in, and well, well I go to church every third and fourth Sunday, and well, you know, and I, I even drink for me, I have nothing against anybody. Well, I, I give my tithes, and you know, I even helped somebody last week, you know. Let me, let me help you to understand something. We better understand what a real relationship with Jesus Christ is so that we know that we know that we know. Now, let, let me help you with, with this because I've thrown it out there. So I need to give you a few things so you know that you're not going to hell, that you know your relationship is, is really, really good with him. It's good. Let, first, let's do this. I, I'm skipping around. I, I'm, I'm so burdened right now. Uh, Reverend back there, I didn't give you this verse. Can you put 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 up on, on the wall? I know if this is this just came to me this morning. I want to I wanna go here and hang out here just for a few minutes. You got your Bibles turned there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We have got to understand and we've got to get we've got to get this. 
so we understand who we are. We understand what it is that God requires of us. We understand that there is only two, two responses to the gospel, yes or no, which means either heaven or hell. Guys, we have to get this. We got to get this. Even in this small church, like I said, I, I fear the worst that some of us are self-deceived and we just are not in him like we think we are. You got it up there for me, Rev? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I want everybody to see this. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Are we good? Yes. All right. Verse 9, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Let me stop right there. Guys, this is not a matter of having temporary lapses in what we mess up. This is a matter of us actually knowing that we're doing wrong. Yet, because I made a confession, you know, 10 years ago, or when I was 15 or 12, then I'm okay. But I know I'm doing wrong. Don't be deceived this morning. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody in the world is deceived. Y'all, you hear me? That, that's very clear. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? That brings me to tears. Then he says the words, don't fool yourselves. Check your meter this morning. How am I walking? When you're by yourself, how am I walking? You have stuff that you know you need to settle with people. How am I handling that? That's wrong. Wrong is wrong. How am I treating my wife, husband? How am I treating my, my husband, wife? If I'm treating them wrong, I can't treat somebody wrong and then say, well, me and God are good. Does that, do y'all hear what I'm saying? That's wrong. Wrong is wrong. We know right from wrong. Why? Because he placed it on our conscience even before we received the word. Okay. He said, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge, and he lays it out, in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes. Listen to my guys. Let me, let me talk to my, my men and my young men. If you're giving yourself away because it's, society has said that's what guys do, you fall into this character. You're nothing but a male prostitute. Do you hear me today? Amen. I pray my boys are virgins, as I said it, when they get married. That's what a real man does. He waits. He don't go around planting himself all over. That's just absolutely sinful. or male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality. I, I, I don't need to really say that, do I? Okay. Or are thieves, or greedy people. Y'all hear this? I didn't write this. Or drunkards. Or are abusive. Or cheat people. Let, let me back up to the abusive piece. See, being abusive doesn't mean you have to hit anyone. Just don't talk to them. My wife, when we first got married, we were both just young and green. And she knew the way to get to me was just don't say nothing to me. And it will tick me off. Woman, you gonna talk to me and she just walked through the house. <laughs> Whatever. And it would infuriate me. I would be, I would be so upset. I'm like, this is abuse. <laughs> what, what are you? <laughs> but we have grown. <laughs> we don't do that no more. <laughs> All 
All right, listen, listen. Or cheat people. And here's, here's where it gets really, really hard and straight to the point. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Did y'all hear what I just read? None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you, now, hit, now, now, now you can get ready to shout. Where's Jane? Dun, 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 dun. Okay. <laughs> None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. 11. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. Amen. You were made holy. Amen. You were made right with God by, here it is, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Amen. Now, you want to know how to get right? Yes. There it is. That's it. That's it. But if you notice, he made a clear distinction on what's right and how you make sure you made right with him. What's right and what's wrong. Are we clear? So this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut it down right here. I just want you to understand. Make sure you're sure. That's number one. And even if you're sure, the most egregious crime the church commits is to have this truth and then we don't tell anybody about Jesus Christ who saved your soul. He's the lover of your soul, your very soul. You're going to heaven and you're okay with somebody that you know going to hell. Egregious. Let me put you in another category. You're in the wrong category. If you don't open your mouth and ever share the greatest news ever. Ever. But here's the good news again. Those of us who've been cleansed by his blood, we ought to be on our feet. We ought to be shouting and dancing because we once were lost, but now we're found. We're not going to hell. Let, let me, I ain't going to hell. Y'all get you. I'm not going to hell for nobody. I'm not going to be upset with anybody, bad with anybody. I'm not going to be having these temper tantrums with anybody. I love my wife. I kiss her every day. Tell how beautiful she is, how much I love her. Even though my feelings may not always line up that way, you got to sometimes say what you don't feel, and then your feelings will line up with what you do. Amen. Do y'all understand? Yes. So I'm not going, I'm not letting anybody or anything move me to going toward, to go to hell. Not happening. Not for Kim Moore. Church, you got a decision. Are you going to let a thing, a person, a place, a noun, a protein, or whatever send you to hell? <laughs> You better come to grips. You better come to grips because what I just read, that's a place that lasts forever and it is complete torture. I thank God and give him glory for saving my soul, snatching me out of the mire coat. I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, I was on the express way to hell when I questioned his existence and he was so good to me, he spoke to me audibly and said, I am. The great I am, which was, which is, which is to come. I hadn't read that before. And it was at that point I knew that he was real. And I knew that my destiny was now with him. And hell was not an option for me. This morning, make sure, you know, first of all, hell is real. And make sure it's not an option for you. Make sure it's not an option for you. Amen? Amen. Would you stand at your feet? Father, this morning we... We look into your word and we, we see, Lord, that you spoke more about hell than heaven. And that kind of blew my mind as I studied to prepare this morning. And the thing that, that struck me, Lord, is that you were so concerned with a person's soul that you didn't always give them ice cream. Lord, you gave them broccoli. You gave them green beans. You gave them the real stuff that was going to happen. Lord, if they couldn't see fit to choose life over death. Father, this morning I pray that you've moved on somebody's heart and their soul, that they know that they have been going down the wrong path. And they're ready to submit their hearts to understand, Lord, that hell is forever. Lord, I don't ever want to use a scare tactic 
to have somebody to come down to, to receive you as Lord and Savior. But Lord, you talked about hell more than heaven, so Lord, you know what you're doing. People ought to know that there's a real place. Everybody's not going to heaven. And so this morning, Father, I pray that if there's anyone right now, you will begin to stir their hearts to the point of where they realize, do I really want to go to hell? And they would immediately, Father, be awakened in their hearts and their spirit and their soul that they come clean and say, Lord, save me because if you don't, I'm going to hell. This morning, Lord, we pray for anyone in this room under the sound of my voice who may be hearing you now for the first time in a very tangible, very real way. Father, I pray that they move quickly as the invitation is given this morning. And Lord, this church will dance, celebrate, shout, and give you glory for any souls of who are coming to the reality that you are real. And heaven and hell is real. So we thank you this morning. We look forward to the fruits of what you're all about this morning. Souls being brought to life. In Jesus' name I pray. Church said? Amen. Amen.